Rod and Line by Arthur Ransom The First Day at the River The pleasure of the first day at the river begins some months before it. It is, in its beginning, a little, quiet, rippling pleasure, like a stream near its source, made up of all kinds of imaginings too remote to be very disturbing. It swells as time goes on. Tributaries join it, such as the pleasure on some cold winter's day of tying a few flies ready for the season, visits to fishing tackle shops, a letter from a friend showing that he has not forgotten that you and he decided last year that you would open this season together, occasional inspections of tackle, oilings of reels, small varnishings, and other excuses for taking your fly rod from its case. A trout scale clinging to the cork handle since last year has quite a notable effect when you discover it unexpectedly. The little, almost secret stream of pleasure swells gradually as the day draws near, and if the day is long postponed, the effect is like that of damming up a river. A day or two before you do at last get to the water, you are likely to answer absent-mindedly if people question you on less important matters and to talk too long if they happen to mention the one subject which is now in almost complete possession of you. On the eve of the day, you plan to go to bed early in order to be able to catch the morning train without loss of sleep, but do, as a matter of fact, go to bed later than usual. In spite of all your long expectation, there is so much to be thought of at the last minute, so many things that must not be forgotten, besides a sort of exultation that would not let you sleep, even if you were to go upstairs to bed. The proper thing to do on the eve of your first day at the river is to lose a game of chess. You will have no chance of winning it unless your opponent is a fisherman, and unless he, too, is visiting the river for the first time next day. But you can play and lose with a good heart and the utmost equanimity, your mind fluttering to and fro between the winding river that you have not seen since last year and the chessboard, which, with its rectangular squares, its mathematical precision, is the greatest possible contrast to it. Lord Grey, in an incomparable paragraph, has described going to the railway station to go fishing thirty years ago. He said that the best way to get the utmost relish out of that, when living in London, was to walk over Westminster Bridge and to neglect the handsome cabs, in some way different from all others, that were to be found at certain places by those who looked for them in the early morning. The best way today is to get there as quickly as possible, for with all your preparations you will be running it fine for the train. Also, a scurry through the town at the last minute is the best prelude for the leisure of the riverside. It is like the pepper which Keats put in his mouth, the better to enjoy the coolness of claret. It is good, however, if on the way to the station you get a glimpse of trees, in bud or young leaf. The chalk stream season opens late enough for that, and, even with our earlier northern opening, trees in Manchester contrive to give us some foretaste of the spring. The train journey, no matter how well you know it, will take longer than you expect. But after you get out of the train, the further journey to the riverside is short, no matter how long you take about it. You are already there, and ashamed of your previous hurry. You prolong these last moments instead of trying to shorten them. But you discover a curious indifference as to what you are to have for supper, and accept without question the suggestions of the inn or lodging keeper. I never take out my fly rod and put it together at the riverside for the first time in the season without an uncanny fear that I have forgotten what little I have ever learnt. I would always rather make my first cast in private. Last Saturday, visiting one of the smaller Hampshire chalk streams for the first time since getting back to England, I did not begin fishing until I had seen my companion, about a field away, rise and lose a fish. His season, at least, had begun well. It would be a rare bad omen to hook and catch the first fish you rise. The three miracles should come singly. The first is that your line does, after all, shoot out, and that your fly does, after all, drop splashless on the water. 
The second is that a fish rises to your fly. If you are not to miss it, you will be cramming the second and third miracles into one. For the third and properly separate miracle is that when you rise a trout again, you find with a surprise new each year that you have hooked it. With any luck, that first fish will be undersized and you will put yourself on good terms with the stream by putting it back. Not throwing it, but dropping it gently in the quiet water at the edge and seeing it suddenly realize that it is free. After that, you are fishing in earnest and there is little to distinguish your first day of the season from any other day's fishing. Although perhaps in each year you get a particular satisfaction from the first of many small experiences that will become habitual before the season is over. There is a little extra delight in the first flash of a moving fish that you notice underwater. The first sight of a feeding fish approaching your fly before he breaks the surface. The first detection from, for example, the behaviour of bubbles, that there is in some unlikely place a bit of slow-moving water which should hold a good fish. And the first triumph, when that good fish, so detected, proves you right by taking a firm hold of your fly when you drop it carefully, just within reach of him. You are rather like a child, going through its whole vocabulary and delighted by the successful remembrance of each word. The first day of the season should not end with an empty basket, it is not likely to, for the trout are as unaccustomed to the angler as he to them. But there is no need that it should end with a full one. It would be out of nature and disheartening to make one's best basket on the opening day. No, it should be a day like last Saturday, ending for the two of us with nothing to quarrel about, four brace and three and a half, the best fish being with a man who'd caught the lesser number, and the two baskets emptied in the evening, making a handsome sight upon a decent dish. And, even if everything has gone just as it should, perhaps the greatest satisfaction of the first day of the season is the knowledge in the evening that the whole of the rest of the season is to come. Fisherman's Patience Nothing is more trying to the patience of fishermen than the remark so often made to them by the profane, I have not patience enough for fishing. It is not so much the remark itself, showing a complete and forgivable ignorance of angling as it does, that is annoying, as the manner in which it is said, the kindly, condescending manner in which Ulysses might tell Penelope that he had not patience for needlework. What are they, these dashing, impatient sparks? Are they d'Artagnan's all? Rough riders, playboys of a western world, wild, desperate fellows who look for a spice of danger in their pleasures? Not a bit of it. They hit a ball backwards and forwards over a net or submit to the patient drudgery of golf. A laborious form of open-air patience in which you hit a ball, walk earnestly after it and hit it again. These devotees of monotonous artificial pleasures who say that fishing is too slow a game for them seem to imagine that fishing is a sedentary occupation. Let them put on waders and fish up a full river and then walk down it on a hot summer day. Let them combine for an afternoon the arts of the Red Indian and the Mountaineer and in the intervals of crawling through brambles and clambering over boulders keep cool enough to fill a basket with the upstream worm. Let them discover that they have to take their coats off when salmon fishing on a day when the line freezes in the rings. Let them spin for pike in February or trout in August. They will find that they get exercise enough. Some forms of fishing are sedentary in the purely physical sense, in that after a man has baited a spot for carp or roach or anchored a boat for perch, he keeps still. But he has not attained a sort of nirvana, like a crystal gazer, isolating himself from nature by concentration on a miserable ball. His mind is not dulled, but lively with expectation, and of all the virtues, patience is the one he least requires. Of all kinds of fishing, only one requires patience, and that is trailing a bait after a boat when someone else is doing the rowing. Even in those forms of fishing which do not mean moving about, it never occurs to an angler to pride himself on his patience. Self-control, if you like, 
but not the most leisurely of all the virtues. There would be patience needed to watch a float which, there being no fish in the water, you knew would never budge, but none in watching a float that may at any moment make a demand for instant action. What other people mistake for patience in anglers is really nothing of the sort but a capacity for prolonged eagerness, an unquenchable gusto in relishing an infinite series of exciting and promising moments, any one of which may yield a sudden crisis with its climax of triumph or disaster. Something rather like patience may be required by the kind of fisherman who casts a fly mechanically and uniformly and is jerked into consciousness only by some extraordinarily altruistic little trout who, in a passion of benevolence, hangs himself on the end of an undeserving line. But such fishermen seldom persist, and if they do persist, learn to fish in a different manner. Fishing, properly so-called, is conducted under continuous tension. The mere putting of fly or bait in the water is an action needing skill, an action that can be done well or ill, and consequently a source of pleasure. Many an angler returns with an empty basket after a day made delightful by the knowledge that he was putting his float exactly where he wanted it, casting his fly a little better than usual, or dropping his spinner with less splash at greater distances. The mere athletics of casting give the fishermen all the golfer's pleasure in good driving or putting. But, and here is the point, there is no red flag to show the angler in what direction he should aim, to take from him all initiative, to put him, as it were, in blinkers. His free will is limited only by his skill in execution. If he is a trout fisher, he is watching the river for a rise, for a boil, for the slight swirl in the water that betrays a fish feeding below, for the roll in the surface made by a submerged stone, above which may be a motionless pocket, below which may be a minute eddy, either a fit place for a trout to lie in wait for his dinner. Now and again, if the river is new to him, he will find a hole in what he had thought was continuous shallow, and will tell himself to remember next time to fish that spot before he comes to it. All the time he is watching for cover, and will use the hole that he kicked himself for not seeing before he came to it, to keep low and out of sight while he casts to another likely spot above. He marks where the water runs slow under the banks. At the hang of a pool, he tries to put his flies at once, just where the fish is likeliest to be. He knows that a mistake is all but irrevocable, that a first cast has a better chance than a second, and a second a better chance than a third. His day is a long series of crises and demands on his presence of mind. Even in float fishing, so much depends on observation, on watercraft, on the reading of barely perceptible signs, that those who imagine that a good fisherman can watch his float and think of something else beside his fishing are very much mistaken. So completely does fishing occupy a man that if a good angler had murdered one of those people who prate about patience and were allowed to spend his last day at the river instead of in the condemned cell, he would forget the rope. The ultimate test is one of time. Patience is a virtue required when time goes slowly. In fishing, time goes too fast. Fishermen's wives are unanimous in deploring the hopeless unpunctuality of their husbands at the fag end of the day. Fishermen rarely have time to eat all the sandwiches provided for their luncheons. If, on occasion, they do eat in leisure at the waterside, it is with the peculiar relish that accompanies stolen fruit. They run a race with the sun, and are always finding that it has beaten them, and is casting their shadow on the water long before they had expected to have to cross the river. The only time that seems to the fisherman longer than it is is that in which he is playing a big fish, then, indeed, his drawn-out anxiety makes him apt to think he spent an hour in landing a salmon which was actually on the bank in fifteen minutes. But no one will suggest that those minutes were so dull that they needed to be patiently borne.